Welcome to this presentation relating to sentence fragments. I'm going to start by giving you a bit of a disclaimer to this um, presentation. There will be some of you who are listening who um, have almost an instinctive understanding of whether something is a sentence or not. You may not know the names for the various components of a sentence. You may not be able to say exactly what's missing or why it needs to be there, but you just know that that's not a sentence. And many people who have this almost instinctive understanding also have an almost instinctive understanding about how to fix it. So that's one section of the audience. Uh, those folks don't really need any help, and maybe I can introduce them to a few uh, grammar terms that will let them talk a little bit more um, uh, clearly about what's happening from a grammar perspective. But uh, they've got all the tools they need. They just don't necessarily have the vocabulary. Um, then there's another group of students who this is really kind of a daunting thing. And because it is for many people so instinctive, it is actually rather hard to put into words what makes a sentence a sentence versus it being a fragment. So if you are in the second category, the first thing to say is, you're okay, we can fix this, but it's not gonna be a, a 15 minute lecture. 15 minute lecture isn't gonna help a lot of people. I mean, I hope that when you hear this, if you were confused before, a light bulb goes off and you suddenly know it for all time, uh, that would be lovely and I hope that's your experience. But it probably means there are several pieces of the puzzle that haven't quite snapped for you. And it's going to take a little bit more work to get you to the finish line. We'll get there, but we're going to have to take more steps. And it's going to probably have to be beyond a lecture format. So if at the end of this lecture your head is reeling and you're like, ah, I don't really know that I got it, come see me. Uh, come to my office hours, make an appointment. We'll figure out a time to get together. This is one of those things you can't become a paralegal if you aren't able to solve the sentence fragment problem. So this is kind of a all points bulletin need to get this fixed. Can you get it fixed? Absolutely. Will it be a 15 minute lecture? Probably not. Do you need to do it now? Well, you don't need to do it today, but you need to do it before the end of this semester. So come see me. I will be delighted to work with you. I will work with you as many minutes, hours as we need to do to get you to that finish line. Probably what it will be in, will involved is doing lots of road exercises again and again and again. And I can point you to some resources you can do independently if you don't want to hang out with me all, all that time. But we can get you to the finish line, but you really, really do need to get there. This is a, a pretty basic and important part of, of being a legal writer, and paralegals are legal writers. So the one I like to compare it to, just for a point of, of, of reference, is uh, being tone deaf. Um, I don't know that I'm tone deaf, but I'm pretty darn close to it. I don't really like music. I don't dis that's it's too strong to say I dislike it, but it doesn't really interest me. Um, I have a daughter who is in the band, and um, she has been a very conscientious practicer of her instrument, and she doesn't do well. Um, and there are other students who I'm sure practice much, much less than she practices, and they're much uh, doing much better. Um, they have an ear for music. My daughter and I just absolutely don't. Um, that doesn't mean that we're dumb. That doesn't mean that we are somehow broken and can't be fixed. It does mean that it's a lot harder for us to get to that finish line when it comes to music than it will be for somebody else. Um, so you might have a great ear for music, but you have, you have your tone deaf, quote unquote, when it comes to identifying a sentence fragment. Uh, just recognize that that's something that's going to take a little bit more work, but you can get there. So I look forward to seeing those of y'all that are in that category. If uh, 25 people are in this class, there will be several people who are in that category. And so uh, at the end of this lecture, metaphorically raise your hand, identify yourself, and reach out to me, and we'll get this problem solved. Let's get started, though, um, just talking about the mechanics, and hopefully that light bulb will go off. Okay. So we're gonna talk about rules for finding and fixing fragments. This is actually a chomp chomp document. 
Um, by the way, if you haven't become familiar with chompchomp.com, there's lots and lots of cool grammar tools that they have. It's a resource that I, I recommend to students who would like to work independently on their grammar. You'll find this resource. Let me just go to our um, class. Here we go. So if we go to our modules, and it is currently in module three. It might be in a different module for your semester. So um, whatever module you're watching this video is the module that you will find this document. And you can see it says sentence fragments. That's the document that um, I have pulled up here. So here we go. Okay. It's not the only resource, by the way. There's lots and lots of resources in this area, and there's additional resources on Canvas for this, and I have additional resources beyond that. So you will not lack for opportunities to work on this stuff. Let's get started. Well, the first thing you have to do to fix a fragment is find it to be able to identify it. A sentence has to have three things. It has to have a subject, it has to have a predicate, and usually when we're talking about a predicate, we're focusing upon a verb, and it has to express a complete idea. Those are the three pieces. If it's missing one of those, it's not a sentence. Likely, it's a fragment, and a fragment doesn't stand on its own. Actually, before I go too far down this road, let me talk about something related to this. You may be thinking, or perhaps you're thinking, well, why do I care whether it's a sentence or a fragment? I mean, isn't the purpose of legal writing to communicate ideas, and can't I do that through fragments? Well, there's two answers to that. Um, I'm going to give you the um, logical one and then the real life one. The logical one is sentence fragments are inherently ambiguous. There's something missing, and so the reader has to fill in the blank about what's missing. Sometimes it's pretty obvious what's missing, and so the reader doesn't have that hard of a time filling in that blank, but it is inherently a little bit ambiguous, and so we don't like ambiguity in legal writing. Our goal is to communicate very, very clearly to advance our client's perspective, so that's the uh, practical, the official reason why we don't do sentence fragments, and I think it's a valid reason, uh, but you, when we go through these examples, you'll see many of these fragments really aren't that ambiguous. And so you might say, well, you know, Gruber, that doesn't really apply in this sentence. Everybody knows what's being discussed. So let me tell you the second reason, which really is the real, real, real reason why we don't use sentence fragments. They're not grammatically correct. In the legal world, we are judged based upon our use of grammar. Um, you can't send a letter to opposing counsel without somebody in that office sitting back there and making a judgment about you as a legal professional, also about your law firm, also about your client, based upon how well that letter is. It may not be um, you know, a formal evaluation, but you have made an impression. And if there are grammatical problems in your documents, it is not a good impression. And that has, in some sense, hurt your client. Even if your letter was crystal clear and very effective at communicating whatever you wanted to, to communicate. Um, and this would apply to communication to the court, to opposing counsel, even to your client. Um, the, the wonderful thing about sentence fragment uh, work is that once you're able to identify it, once it clicks in your head, um, you will be able to find it quickly and you'll be able to fix it painlessly. So this isn't going to be a hard problem. This isn't as hard a problem, for example, as passive voices. Um, so those are the, the true, real reasons why we want to do this. I will tell you that um, if you read fiction or you read blogs, you will see um, sentence fragments all over the place. It has become uh, the flavor of the month in, in uh, non-legal writing. You see it all of the time. What the background for why people write sentence fragments, and many of, the, many of these people who write these sentence fragments are doing it completely intentionally. They absolutely know the rules and they are deciding to violate the rules. And the reason 
in my opinion, why they do it is that they want their written document to mimic human speech. The reality is when most of us speech speak, we do not speak in complete sentences. Um, there are complete sentences that we will utter, but most of the time it's fragments. And so if you were to say have a tape recorder and it follows you throughout the day and it hears everything you say and everything that is said to you, and then someone were to transcribe that, you would see that most of the communications were not complete sentences and 90% of the time it would be very clear what that person was saying and what you were saying. Everyone was communicating effectively. So this trend towards writing in sentence fragments is really a trend saying, hey, let's write exactly the way that we speak. And that's a very informal way of writing. Um, that's not legal writing. Legal writing does not try to imitate human speech nearly to that degree. We want to improve upon it. When I speak, it's extemporaneous. I haven't planned out the sentence I'm about to say for several seconds. Um, it just starts out of my mouth. When I start the sentence, I'm not sure where it's going to end, right? Uh, that's how we speak. And as a result, it's very, very common for people to have sentence fragments in their speech or for them to have grammatical problems in their speech. And whenever you're doing something on the fly like that, you're going to have those types of errors. It's the human experience. But when I write, I can think about it. I can make it better. I can move things around. I can change things. I can listen to it <coughs> excuse me, one way <coughs> and then try it a different way. That's the beauty of writing. And so why would you want to produce a document that just imitates human speech? <coughs> Human speech is that rough first draft. It's not the polished final draft that you want. So <coughs> this trend in language, this use of sentence fragments, has, a, has had a negative effect, I believe, on students' ability to identify sentence fragments. Because routinely, you and I are going to be seeing Things that kind of look like sentences, I mean, they start with a capital letter and they end with a period. And in between, though, that capital and the period is not a sentence. But we see it so commonly that we've developed kind of a, a, a callousness toward it. We, we think it's okay. It seems okay. We've seen it enough times um, that we no longer react as like, well, what's going on there? I uh, had a coworker once who was from... Um, Wisconsin. Yeah, that's right. Wisconsin. And I hadn't been around a lot of people from Wisconsin before. She was lovely, liked her a lot. And she would say something, an expression. If she uh, wanted to have lunch with me, she would come into my office and she'd say, would you like to come with? And the first couple of times I heard that, I thought, that's weird. Why didn't she say come with me? That's obviously what she meant. She might be waving with her hand or whatever. I knew what she meant, but it just sounded odd to me. And my first thought was, um, you know, this is a peculiarity of her speech pattern. But I had the opportunity to go on some business trips to Wisconsin, and I saw that there were other people who used this expression. They would, when, when instead of saying the me, they would, they would drop the me, it was kind of implied, and they would say just with, without the me. And um, I was around this coworker for a while, and I was around these people from Wisconsin in my working situation, and lo and behold, I started saying it. So I went from a, a certain kind of confusion and honestly a feeling of this is bizarre, to adopting it. And that's kind of what I'm concerned that these sentence fragments is doing. We, we, the first time we see a sentence fragment in a written document or published document, we like, what? What's going on there? But after we see it the 100th time, we start thinking, oh yeah, that's, that's normal. And why don't I start doing that too? Please don't fall into that trap. I mean, I don't care what you do in your personal correspondence, except when you do things in your personal or informal writing, it's, it's kind of a slippery slope to getting involved in your, in your more formal writing. So a word of caution that I have is try to use complete sentences when you're texting, when you're sending emails, when you're writing documents in other uh, situations so that you keep that kind of pure line and you don't uh, become sloppy in this area.
of course, that's your call, but that's a piece of advice for me. So we've talked about the three things that we need for a sentence to have. We need to have a subject. We need to have a verb, which is the, the if, if in a sentence you, you in the in their earnest, you mean the independent clause within a sentence, you have two portions. You have the subject and you have the predicate. The subject is what's doing the verb, and the predicate is the verb and everything after the verb. So we have, and, and, and the verb itself is called the simple predicate. So we have the subject, the simple predicate, and we need to have a complete th thought. Let's go through three examples of fragments and see what's going wrong with these. The first one is missing a, a subject. It says, and yawned loudly enough to make everyone in class turn around. Okay, who yawned? We don't know. Um, so that's what we're missing. You're missing the subject because we don't know who's doing the verb. We do have a verb, yawned is a verb, and it does present a complete, well, it actually doesn't complete, uh, present a complete thought because we don't know who's doing the action. Okay, so let's go over here and see if we can change this sentence. Well, one way to do it would just be to put who yawned. We'll say Bob yawned loudly enough to make everyone in class turn around. Okay, not the best sentence ever, but it passes muster as a sentence. So you can simply, when, you, when your sentence is missing a subject, just, you know, add a subject. Okay, so that's when we're missing a subject. Let's go on to the next one. This one we're gonna be missing a verb. The boy sitting on the fire escape, dropping water balloons on the pedestrians below. Now your first reaction might be, well, gosh, that seems like there's verb. I mean, I, I'm seeing a mental image of what's happening, so surely there's verbs. We have sitting after all, and we have dropping. Well, these actually aren't verbs. Uh, they are uh, participles. When you see an ing ending, you actually have a, past, a present participle, present participle. It can be part of a verbal phrase, but it, it by itself is not a verb. So we don't have a verb in this uh, particular sentence. Um, and we have a subject though, we have the boy. The boy is a subject. And when, because we're lacking the, um, the, the verb, we do not have a complete thought, okay? So let's look at how we could change it. Well, we could take our present participles and turn them into verbs. That would be a pretty easy thing. So we'll say the boy, how about this? We'll say the boy is sitting on the fire escape throwing water balloons in the pedestrians below. All I had to add was a two word sentence. This is now a verb. This is now a verbal phrase. So we have, our subject, and we have our verb, and this has become a complete sentence. We could, if we wanted to, make this into a verb. It's now a present participle, but we don't have to. If we wanted to, then we would need to make some other changes to sentence, so I'm not going to do that at this time. Okay, let's go back to our last example. After Gabriel ate half a box of donuts. All right. Well, um, this has a subject, Gabriel, and it has a verb, ate. In fact, it has a whole predicate, ate half a box of donuts. So it seems like it has all the things we need for a sentence. What it's missing, though, is a complete thought. After Gabriel ate half a box of donuts, something must have happened. Maybe he got sick. Maybe he went to school. Maybe he, um, you know, got into his car and drove to, you know, to Afghanistan. I don't know what he did. He did something, though, because why do we have the word after here unless Gabriel does this, A, first, and then he does B, second. And so what are some ways we can fix it? Well, there's two ways that present themselves for fixing this one. One is we, this is called a subordinate, subordinating conjunction. Whenever you have a subordinating conjunction, whatever is part of that, con, uh, that, that, that phrase that follows can't be a full sentence. And you can see all of these are part of that idea after Gabriel ate half a box of donuts. So we have two choices. One is we could remove 
our um, sub subordinating conjunction and just say Gabriel ate half a box of donuts. He then went to school. Okay. So we have two sentences here. That would work. Actually, because we've removed the after, we don't actually even need that. But let's think of another way. Another way would be to say, well, this is a subordinating clause, but we need a main clause. Okay, so we're going to put a comma here, and we're going to say, after Gabriel ate half a box of donuts, he went to school. Now we have a complete sentence. Of course, now the subject is the he, and went is our um, verb. And the whole sentence becomes our complete thought. So those are, there's a few ways of, of fixing this. I'm going to go back to our first way oops, sorry, of just removing after, just to keep things simple. OK, let's go on to our next test. So you can see three ways of, figure, of deducing that something is a fragment. Let's look at some telltale signs of fragments. Now, no one is going to be, and I'll say no one, it's unlikely that you're going to be interested in investing the amount of effort to memorize these entire lists of words that can interfere with something becoming a sentence. So my suggestion would be, if this is something that you're struggling with, is to go ahead and print this out and ha keep it handy, maybe in a notebook. So when you're doing legal writing and you're not sure whether something is a sentence fragment or not, you can look at this list and get it, get a reminder. So um, that's a strategy. Uh, some of the more important ones you might want to memorize, but for the most part, I don't think that's the best use of your time. So let's look at the two main categories of sentence fragments. Um, oh, well, let's talk about how to correct sentence fragments. I'm sorry. One way would be to um, add something to the sentence. And that's what we did in all these cases. We added our subject, we added our verb, or we removed a subordinating conjunction. But the second approach would be to unite it with another sentence. Let's say in our original sentence, if we hadn't gotten rid of the after, we could have united our fragment with a sentence that goes after it, and we could have said, after Gabriel ate half a box of donuts, he then went to school. And so now we have everything from that on is new. Those are our main two strategies that we can do. We can add something to what we already have to make it a sentence, or we connect it to another section. Okay, sometimes, uh, so if you choose, especially the second path of connecting it to another sentence, usually the sentence before or the sentence after, you're going to have to confront the issue of commas. Dun, 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 dun. Um, we will have another section on commas significantly later in the semester. Commas are hard. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I think there's relatively few people who um, have really mastered the comma. Um, I still look up comma rules. So um, it's fine. In fact, it can be very um, uh, effective from a legal writing standpoint to, to follow the second rule, to connect the fragment with the main clause already in the passage. Um, either before or after. But uh, because of the comma issue, that's probably not going to be your go-to until you've really had time to work on the comma. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the whole area of comma, but I'm really going to save that discussion for our comma section. So I'm going to be focusing on that first choice, which is fleshing out the sentence fragment that we have so that it becomes its own sentence. Okay, so we're going to talk about a few scenarios that get you sentence fragments. And these are just common ones. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are common ways that you can, um, or that a writer can inadvertently use a fragment when he or she meant to have a full sentence. And you can see we have one, two, three, four, five, six different ways, but it's, it's not a complete list. Um, the, the key to this, or the, the helpful thing to this, is that 
when you have any of these situations, you're going to oftentimes have a marker, and I'm going to sh we're going to go over some of those markers. But I want to give you a caveat about that. These markers that we're about to cover can exist and do routinely exist in perfectly good complete sentences. So just because you see the word because doesn't mean that you have a sentence fragment. It uh, could be a perfectly good sentence, it probably is a perfectly good sentence, but if you have a sentence fragment, it could be that uh, your although or your after um, is all you have is the after clause or all you have is the although clause. Okay, so let's talk for a second about conjunctions. Um, we will have a section, let me see if I can get the annotator, here we go. We will have a section where we talk about fanboys later in the semester, but I'm just going to introduce you to fanboys if you haven't had a chance to meet them yet. This is a little a mnemonic device to remember coordinating conjunctions. Coordinating conjunct, well, let me first of all just write them up here. A coordinating conjunction is different than a subordinating conjunction. A coordinating conjunction pairs up two equal clauses. They are like two kings meeting for di diplomatic, or two uh, presidents meeting for diplomatic purposes. They're peers, they're on equal standing. A subordinating situation though, so this is coordinating conjunctions, so to two peers, two equals meeting. These aren't situations that you have to be uh, concerned about. I mean, these words can exist in a sentence fragment, but they don't cause a sentence fragment. Subordinating conjunctions are when a prince meets with his butcher. They're different levels of power and authority. And the subordinating conjunction in front of a phrase demotes it, makes it uh, a bit player in the, the movie. It's kind of like, you know, a movie with Brad Pitt um, and also it has Bob Green in it. Well, guess who's the star, right? Brad Pitt. Bob Green, he might have a couple of lines to say. He might have a few seconds of screen time. He's a bit player. The movie isn't about him. He is has a subordinate or an inferior or a less important role than Brad Pitt. So Brad Pitt would be the main clause, the independent clause, and Bob Green would be the subordinate clause. But how do, how uh, the, the way that you know which one is the main clause and which one is the subordinate clause is one of these conjunctions, and one of these con conjunctions demotes what could have been an independent clause into a subordinate clause. Let's go back to this document. When we had initially after Gabriel ate a, or here if we've written, after Gabriel ate a box of donuts, he then went to school. When we just have this, let's say this was sentence one, and then we have sentence two, it's not obvious which one is more important. They could be equally important. Once we put the after in front of it, then it becomes obvious which is the rock star of the sentence, our, our phrase in red. But we could rewrite this and make the um, uh, Gabriel the right star, uh, the rock star of the sentence. How about this? Before he went to school, Gabriel ate half a box of donuts. I mean, it's the same facts, but now I have a subordinating conjunction on this phrase, and this becomes our independent clause. So a subordinating conjunction demotes the clause that comes immediately after it, makes it less important than the main clause. So that's what it does, it subordinates, it demotes those clauses. And here are uh, words that do this. I don't know if this is an exhaustive list, this is some of the most common ones, and as you can see in this list, no, I'm not expecting you to memorize these, but if you, if you don't have an, an intuitive sense that these are subordinating, you may wanna write, write these up in the list so you can look for them.
It's um, also some other words, though. It's not just subordinating conjunctions that can have, cause this to happen. This can also happen with relative pronouns. Um, let me give you an example. I'll give you an example. Let's see. Bob Smith, who is a bit player in the movie, was born in Plano. Okay? This is subordinating this fact. Okay, let me write it up so each one is its own sentence. Bob Smith is a bit player in the movie. He was born in Plano. Now these are independent, fully standing sentences on their own. If I were to write it like this, Bob Smith was born in Plano. Who is a bit player? Well, this is a, it, this is not a full sentence. It has a verb, is, um, but it's missing, well, who is the person who's a bit player? Well, it's Bob Smith. Um, so we need to add that for it to make sense. So um, that's an example of, of who uh, subordinating, this fact is subordinating. Well, we could flip it around and we could make the born in Plano being the subordinate fact. Bob Smith, who was born in Plano, is a bit player in the movie. So now we have subordinated this fact by using a relative pronoun. And then you can also do this with relative adver adverbs, and you can see that it would work in a similar way. I won't go through tons of examples for those. And here are some examples. Um, we're going to focus on just this first one. So we have because, starting this phrase, because is one of our subordinating conjunctions. Let's go up here and see. Ah, right there. And you can see after the word because, we have something that looks like a complete sentence. Right? And after all, because we have a subject, Chase, and he's catching somebody's eyes, so we have a verb. So we have a subject and a verb. And if we were to make because go away, we would have a complete thought. Chase caught the eye of the beautiful brunette in algebra. But this because tells us, hey, this is a subordinate fact to another fact. But that other fact is missing from our sentence, so we don't have a complete thought. Let's see what we can do to make it a complete thought. Well, one thing again would be just to remove because. Oops, I didn't mean to underline it. Here we go. Strike it out. And now we'd have. Chase caught the eye of the beautiful brunette in algebra. But let's say we wanted to keep the because. Let me just cut and paste it. Copy. Okay, we're going to change the period to a comma. Remember, we're not really going to talk about the comma, but when you have, we're going to call this an introductory phrase, you need to put a comma uh, before the main clause comes. Because Chase caught the eye of the beautiful brunette in algebra, he was able to earn an A in the class. Okay? This is an independent clause. This could be an independent clause, but it's been subordinated with a because. Um, so that's uh, an example of how we might solve that problem. And again, the other ones can be solved in similar ways. Now we're going to go down to participle phrases. And this is the ing. It doesn't have to be ing. It can also be an ed ending or an en ending. Um, present participles end ing. Past participles end ed. We'll talk a lot about past participles when we get to passive voice. But for now, we're talking about it from the participle perspective. Um, Okay, so typically um, you can, so a participle in this context is acting usually like an adjective. Um, 
for example, hidden in the bureau drawer beneath a pile of mismatched stock, socks. Well, something is hidden there, right? So this is describing whatever it is that is hidden there. Sunning themselves on the hot concrete until they heard human feet crashing down the sidewalk. Okay, so I'm going to add something in front of this. The sun bathers were sunning themselves on the hot cement, hot concrete until they heard human um, human feet crashing down the sidewalk. That would be one way of doing that. Um, I will offer you another option. Setting themselves on the hot concrete, I'm gonna put a comma here. Mabel and Teresa um, stopped when they heard human feet. Crashing down the sidewalk. Those are just two, two suggestions for how you might do this. If we were to shorten it, let, let's just make this into two sentences here. Okay. Setting themselves on the, uh, on the hot concrete, um, Bob and Larry. Um, read novels. They continued reading until they heard human feet crashing down the sidewalk. So that's a, a, a way of solving this problem. Another way would be to change sunning. Mabel and Teresa sun themselves on the hot concrete until they heard human feet crashing down the sidewalk. That could be another way of doing it. Let's talk about our next choice, which is an infinitive uh, phrase fragment. This is actually a little bit trickier. It's not hard to find infinitives. Of course, most of the time, just like all these other examples, most of the time when you see an infinitive in a sentence, it's not a signal T that's a fragment. Um, if, this, if, if all you have is an infinitive phrase, that's when your problem is. Okay, so um, in English, the way we make an infinitive is a little bit unusual. Most European languages don't follow this pattern. For most European languages, the infinitive is an actual form of the verb. So if I want to say to eat in Spanish, I say comer. I don't say to comer. Um, but we have to add the to in English to have the infinitive. To eat. I eat, you eat, they eat, I ate, you ate, they ate, I am eating, you are eating, he is eating, etc., etc. That's uh, some parts of the conjugation of the verb to eat. That's the infinitive. So you know in English when you have an infinitive, when you have the word to and the whatever the, the base word, a verb is. Sometimes there's a word in between the two and the base word. We call that a split infinitive. And some people will tell you you shouldn't do that. It's not a best practice. You ought to avoid it to some extent, but it's not a terrible, terrible thing to split an infinitive. Try to avoid it, but it's not a huge issue. Anyway, our example is only to watch in dismay as Dr. Frazier poured her chemistry experiment into the sink. Okay, well, we have a subject here. I mean, Dr. Frazier is doing something, and we have the verb. He's pouring or she's pouring something. Um, but we know that's not the main idea here because we have this word as, right? Let's go back here. We can see as is a subordinate conjunction. So really what we have here is kind of a double subordinate. This is a subordinate clause. And then this is um, an infinitive phrase. And so we have a verb here, or we have a, an infinitive. So somebody is watching in dismay. Probably 
this girl, right? Um, but we don't know who this person is. We don't have a subject in this sentence. So let's rewrite it to reflect that fact. Okay, let me go on to our next line. Okay. Only to watch in dismay. We'll say her name is Mabel. Mabel only watched in dismay as Dr. Fraser poured her chemistry experiment into the sink. So one way to solve the problem of an infinitive is to give it a, a subject if it's missing a subject and to actually conjugate that verb. Don't keep in the infinitive form, actually put it into a verb. And make sure you're of course using the right tense of that verb so it makes sense in the sentence. To catch butterflies for her biology project. Um, it might be Teresa wanted to catch butterflies for her bio biology project. So you could keep the infinitive in sometimes, but just keep in mind when you are having an infinitive phrase, you're probably missing a subject. Think about what the subject is, put it in the front, and usually you'll be able to figure out pretty intuitively what you want to do with the verb. Let's consider the idea of afterthought fragments. This is when you want to add a little bit more information. Uh, maybe you, uh, other, other circumstances, might even drop this into a footnote. Um, and so you're, you're kind of considering something along those lines um, for a little bit of a FYI purposes. Uh, so this isn't so much of a particular grammar style, but it's a, what your intent is. Um, for, here's some examples of what an afterthought fragment might be. So you, you've you've maybe defined a term or described a situation you're saying for example these fit into that description i just gave including the dog with three legs and the cat with one eye so your previous sentence might say you know george had a collection of unusual pets period including the dog with three three legs and a cat with one eye Usually with afterthought phrases, you're going to want to connect this with the sentence that came directly before it. I mean, you don't have to, but that is a strategy that's probably pretty easy. So the one I have here is, for example, leaking pens, candy wrappers, dollar bills, and paper clips. Bob likes to collect odds and ends. And I'm going to say such as leaky pens, paper wrappers, dollar bills, and paper clips. If I want to keep, for example, I'm going to put a period here. For example, he has leaky pens, paper wrappers, dollar bills, and paper clips. That would be one way of approaching that sentence. Of course, there's a many different ways. Lonely verb fragments. Um, so sometimes the writer uh, doesn't include the subject. Many times in these cases, the subject will be in the previous sentence. So the person who wants to fix the problem can either meld the previous sentence together or repeat whatever the subject is from that previous sentence in this next sentence fragment, making it a real sentence. And you might even want to use a pronoun to complete that. So let's consider this one. So we have a fragment. And dash the downpours rains, soften the hairspray shell, holding her elaborate quaff in place. So Millie, um, Millie put her cell phone in her clutch purse and dashed through the downpour as raindrops softened the hairspray gel holding her elaborate quaff in place. So I added this to the beginning of the sentence and I made the A lowercase. It might have been that the author initially had it like this. 
Um, she, we could also fix this by just taking our subject here, because that's what we're missing from our, fra our thing here, because we have a verb, dashed. So I could repeat Millie, or I could, since Millie's obviously a woman, say she. Millie put her cell phone in her clutch purse, and she dashed through the downpours, raindrops softened the hairspray, gel, hair, hairspray shell holding her elaborate quaff in place. Now some of y'all are likely to respond and say, Groover, you can't start a sentence with a coordinating conjunction. It is true that that is an informal practice. It's not recommended. It is not grammatically incorrect. But I would agree with you, if you're going to keep the and, a better practice would be to do this. This is rule 10 in our Aspen handbook, the common rule. So this would be a better choice in my opinion. Okay. And let's go to our last. These are a positive fragments. And a positive is a restating of something within a sentence. And it's usually set off in a real sentence with commas. Um, let me give you an example of a well-ordered a positive. Bob Smith, the mayor of our town, is also a firefighter, okay? A mayor of our town is in a positive. It's describing Bob Smith. By, oh, by, you know, I, we could have just said Bob Smith is also a firefighter, but um, this is another fact that we're gonna give. It's, we're defining Bob Smith. Maybe not everyone knows who the mayor of our town is. And so this is an appositive for it. And usually um, in, um, in writing, we're going to set it off in commas. So here we have an appositive, but instead of being set off in commas, it's been put into um, its own kind of fake sentence. Um, so let me imagine the sentence that might have come before our appositive. Okay, and you can say here an appositive is really just a noun in this case. An unprepared student who is always begging for an extra pencil and a couple of sheets of paper. Um, it is true that we have a verbal phrase here. Actually, I mean, this is a, a good verb, but it has this um, relative pronoun in front of it, which uh, demotes it, makes it enabled to be an independent clause. And so this whole thing is just a uh, potential subject of a sentence with no actual verb. So let's say this is Bob. Bob never came prepared for class. The unprepared student who is always begging for an extra a pencil and a couple of sheets of paper. Lots of different ways. So this is how it was originally written. We can just say, he was the unprepared student who always was begging paper, was always begging for extra, extra pencil and a couple of sheets of paper. That's one way of solving it. Here's another way. We could reverse the order. Cut this and put this after. The unprepared student who was always begging for an extra pencil and a couple of sheets of blank paper, Bob never came prepared for class. So all of this is just describing Bob. Um, and so that can be a, another way of doing it. This a positive is quite long and a little bit unwieldy, so I wouldn't recommend that. But I think this a positive is good to see because you can see here that this looks like a super long, I mean, this is a pretty long sentence. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Uh, we'll talk about in a later session about how we want to keep our average sentence length to be 20 words or less. This is 18 words, so it's about the right length for a sentence. Um, but it's obviously not what we want to do because it's not a complete sentence. So don't be tricked. Don't see a lot of words together and assume, well, gosh, anything that long has got to be a sentence. You can have a sentence that's two words you know, or even one word sometimes, but we won't talk about that scenario. 
Bob slept. That's a complete sentence. Or we can have something that's 100 words long that isn't a complete sentence. So length doesn't establish whether it, it's a fragment or not. Okay, so when we're trying to fix a fragment, there's, there's mainly three approaches. One approach would be to unite our fragment with the sentence that comes before it. That's strategy one. Strategy number two is to unite our sentence fragment with the sentence that goes after it, strategy two. The third strategy is to change the sentence, the fragment that we have into a complete sentence, but without merging it. So adding the verb, adding the subject, taking away the subordinating conjunction, those things can work. All three of those strategies are good and awesome strategies, and you will likely want to use all three of them from time to time. Um, some things to keep in mind as you're trying to decide which one of those strategies makes the most sense is consider, number one, if you're choosing which sense to unite it to, which one makes most sense, which one is most closely connected with an other, um, you know, with that sentence fragment. Um, if you want to make it into a, a freestanding sentence fragment, I mean, not obviously you're going to make it into a sentence, but take your fragment and make it into a sentence, uh, you want to think about, um, is there enough stuff there to justify it being a sentence? I will tell you usually, at least from a grammar and from a punctuation standpoint, the safer path is going to be taking your sentence fragment and on its own translating it into a complete sentence. <coughs> Oh. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> this goes through some rules about comma usage. Again, we're not yet to talking about commas yet, so I'm not going to talk about these. But this can be a handy resource for you to look at if you are fixing a fragment and you want to apply some of these strategies. Keep in mind that some of the terminology that this slide uses may be different than the terminology that Aspen uses <coughs> with respect to its 13 comma rules. So I'm going to call it quits now again. If you've been watching this presentation, you're thinking to yourself, gosh, I, I, just, I didn't know the, the names for some of this stuff, but I knew all these things were not sentences. And um, I, I would have been able to fix them on my own awesome, wonderful, you don't need to worry about this. You are one of the people that has that ear for fragments, just like some people have an ear for music. Um, just be sure to use it while you're working in this class and, and working in your professional life. If um, you're a person who wasn't quite sure what a fragment was before, but a light has gone off during this presentation, congratulations. You may want to watch this more than once, or you may want to review the material a little bit more to solidify your grasp on this, because we will be having sentence fragments for the rest of the semester. Um, so this won't be the only time that you hear about it, and this won't be the only assignment that you'll be working with it. Or you might be in the third category, which is, yeah, some of this made sense to me, but I still don't feel like I really got it please come see me. Uh, come with your questions, come with some examples. Um, if you don't have those though, I will come up with examples and we can sit down together and we will work on it until that light bulb goes off. Uh, thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day.